This is my counsel. Welcome to the program. I was hoping to have George Saunders with us today. Unfortunately, uh, my invitation was turned down and it was done in a very nice fashion. Uh, he is a, a busy guy, although he's been very generous about showing up on with media interviews and showing up uh, as guests on podcasts and whatnot. He's, he's scaling back from that right now because he's busy with his duties as a creative writing teacher at Syracuse University. Uh, Syracuse, which has one of the best writing programs in the country. And that that's my part of the world, having grown up in Endicott, New York, just 70 miles south of Syracuse. And for those of you who don't know George Saunders, he is the author of, among other books, 10th of December. That's the one that really uh, had him explode on the scene. He was known, well known as a, as a, outstanding short story writer and then he comes out with a book a collection of short stories called 10th of december published in january 2013 and lo and behold it hits number one on the new york times bestseller list i mean how often do you ever hear about a collection of short stories hitting number one on the new york times bestseller list it's basically unheard of it was also selected one of the 10 best books of 2013 by the editors of the new york times book review and I happened to do something with that book that I don't think I've ever done with a book before. I bought the hard copy. I started to read it. Then I decided to buy the audio version of the book as well. So I would read the book while George Saunders read the audio edition of the book simultaneously. I like when an author reads his or her own writing because even if they're not the greatest reader and many of them are not i mean one ex example is paul oster who he's not a great reader but i still like listening to him read his own books the author knows where the vocal inflections are the author knows exactly how they wanted things stated uh, how they wanted things to sound in the mind of the readers and then they they portray it that way in the reading of, of the book now Listening to the audio version while simultaneously reading it uh, might sound a little bit like overkill, but the reason I did that is because I was trying to go deep in the stories that George Saunders had written for 10th of December. And so by getting the author in print and audio simultaneously, that that really worked for me. It was really helpful to hear George Saunders reading it, even as I read it off the page. And I did feel like I went deeper into exactly what he was trying to say. It's not something I plan to do very often again. There is another book, actually, that I plan to do it with. Um, and not to be cagey, so I'll tell you, Philip Roth's book, which is uh, titled, in fact, is his favorite book he's ever written, Sabbath's Theater and is one of those books that i don't know i feel that when i'm reading it there's a certain density to it difficulty in penetrating it and i want the audio version and print version together i tried to do the audio version alone but it was uh honestly it's the sound quality is not good uh this is from audible no less and uh, that's usually not the case with Audible. It is with this particular book. So I'm looking to do that. This worked with 10th of December and George Saunders. And um, I tell you that because if you've never tried it, not necessarily 10th of December, but just any book in both print and audio version, you might uh, find it to be enjoyable. Now, obviously, I wanted George Saunders on the program to share his expert writing advice and he wrote a very nice letter very very brief not curt brief and just said that he's backing away from these appearances right now that he's busy and of course that's the only thing you would expect from george saunders is a very gentlemanly rejection because if you've ever listened to him interviewed he's just a sweetheart of a guy he's a, he's a very gentle spirit Sweet, sweetheart of a guy and tremendously talented, uh, not only as a writer, but as, a, as an instructor. He is the creative writing professor 
uh, at, at the Syracuse University. It's an elite program that he leads there. There's only about six students per semester that are accepted out of 500 to 600 applicants. And then of course, George Saunders has run, won numerous awards for his own work. And interestingly, I only learned this recently that George Saunders thought that the novel was really beyond, beyond him. He was a short story writer. They were manageable and that was uh, what worked for him. That was the form that worked. He didn't really think a novel was for him. Then he wrote his first novel titled, titled Lincoln and the Bardo, which came after 10th of December. That was published in February, 2017. It hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list and became winner of the Man Booker Prize to boot. And George Saunders talks about, I mean, I've, I've listened to interviews with him, so I'm gonna impart some of, some of what I've heard from him. You know, he talks about the tendency of aspiring writers wanting to sound like the author that they most admire. Uh, looking at ourselves as perhaps the next David Foster Wallace or some other legendary writer I've experienced that myself where I'm not David Foster Wallace, but just experienced the sensation of starting to imitate whoever I'm reading at the time. And not that if I'm reading Steinbeck, I write, really like Steinbeck, but I feel the influence of that. And that can be po problematic. This is something that Sidney Sheldon understood, apparently. I'm assuming he did because uh, the late Sidney Sheldon, who was never critically acclaimed, but boy, did he sell a lot of books. And they were quite entertaining, even if they weren't the most literary pieces of work in the world. He would say that when it was time to write, he would isolate himself and he would read nothing else. He'd completely immerse himself in the story that he was working on. He'd read nothing else because he didn't want to be influenced by anything else. That was his writing process. It was very successful for him. Not only did his book sell millions of copies, but there were movies or miniseries made out of some of them. Books with titles like Rage of Angels and The Other Side of Midnight. Now, George Saunders' position is that there is that we have little choice in who and in, in what kind of writer we become, what kind of writer we turn out to be. That's something to really be discovered. We want to emulate the person we consider great, and yet that can be a trap. Our literary gifts might be different. We don't want to mask or obscure them with imitation. The objective should be to write in a way that produces the most energy and appeal using an approach or writing style that is closer to our true self. So George Saunders questions whether we really want to be a second tier David Foster Wallace or to bank on ourselves in our own voice. I mean, David Foster Wallace was an original. If he was trying to imitate somebody else, he never would have been the David Foster Wallace that we know. I was listening to a recent interview with George Saunders about the art of leaving language out of the story rather than including it. And uh, there was a caller into that podcast and she considered, said that she considered George Saunders a master at doing that, selectively taking language out, keeping things lean and leaving language out that that isn't necessary. So George Saunders gave an example of writing um, these three sentences. This is this was kind of a, an example he shared. I quote, the cat walked across the black table, the ebony expanse, the flat zone. And I'm not quoting that exactly. I think I lost something from the last sentence. I think it was a little bit more elaborate than that. But there are three sentences and Sanders Saunders said 
in his reading of the first sentence that it handles the scene, that the next two sentences are basically him showing off. If I'm trying to think of how to respect the reader, I should cut the last two sentences because the last two sentences are just me trying to do a fancy dance. Those are George Saunders' words, not mine. But I agree with them. That's his approach. And he says, there's a lot of power in omission, something I think any experienced writer or reader would agree with. A lot of power in omission. If the imaginary reader can be expected to get it without us saying it, then don't say it. Another example he offered is this. If you're writing about a guy who's about to propose to his girlfriend and he slips on some ice and falls down and then you write, he was humiliated. Nothing is lost by cutting that sentence. The reader already got it. Remember that you can make something more your own by what you choose to omit. That's another way of making voice or creating your own voice, according to George Saunders. You have to be really strict with yourself and take out those things that serve more as a security blanket to make sure that the reader gets your message. I mean, don't we all do that where we overwrite because we want to make sure the reader's understanding what we're saying? So we basically repeat ourselves. And that doesn't show a lot of trust in the reader. We're better off taking it out and trusting that the reader understands our message. So that's some advice and some very sound advice from George Saunders that we can immediately apply to our writing efforts. And by the way, I'm currently reading George Saunders' latest book, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. In that book, he takes short stories from famous Russian novelists and short story writers to offer a masterclass on writing and reading and life in general. I've, I've only started reading that book. I'm, I'm expecting great th things from it, just like everything George Saunders does. And I'm doing that only in print. I'm not trying to uh, do the print and audio simultaneously. Actually, I'm doing that one only in audio. Let me switch that around. I'm doing that one only in audio. So again, George Saunders was too busy to attend this program, but his writing advice and influence are well represented through his body of work, through the interviews he's done. And rather than just say, well, George isn't available, so I can't share anything about him with, with uh, my listeners, I decided that it made a lot more sense just to go ahead and cherry pick just a little bit of what George Saunders has to say about writing that we can immediately put into use and can be really helpful. I think anytime we look back our, at our own writing, we can always see instances where omission would benefit the writing or where we are falling into the imitation game, falling into this idea that we'd sound so much better if we just tried to sound like David Foster Wallace or Toni Morrison or who have you. So I hope to get George Saunders for a future edition of the program. In the meantime, let's embrace his advice and put it to the best use possible in our own writing. And to always try to be influence, but influenced by the best of the best. As always, good luck with your writing and thank you for listening.